So I've been working in IT to some degree since 1989, and that's really the introduction of uh, modern IT, so it was a great time to be working. When I first started working, there were no cell phones, and there was no really publicly known web browsing, World Wide Web. Uh, really, internet email was mostly for universities and, and um, government facilities. So it was, uh, it was really uh, something to see all the, how, how fast paced it all has evolved uh, since then. I've been with uh, Network Solutions for 15 years and about the past uh, 10 years or so I've been focused on security. All right. So today we're going to talk about ransomware. Where do we get it? How do you get it? How uh, it works? Break it down? and how do you defend against it. Then uh, we'll, have, uh, we'll take a little break and then Brian will do his presentation. Afterwards, I'll do an on-screen demo of Cisco Umbrella. And then for those of you who are interested afterwards, uh, we can start up a, a quick uh, um, Umbrella trial, okay? Okay, so first I wanna have you have a look at this video. It's great to get attention. This is very fast moving video, but it's very informative. Try to pay attention to details. I'm going to be going through it and taking it apart a little bit later in the presentation. How did you decide to become a hacker? <laughs> well, I'm not really sure what it means to become a hacker. That's like some guy in a hoodie who types really fast and stays up all night writing code and cracking passwords. It's not me. I just spy on people and see what makes them click. Not a bad job. Mark Hanning, CEO of Qualicart, said to report earnings after their blockbuster IP. So you consider this a job? I put a lot of work into this. I'm not lazy. It takes research to figure out the key players, learn all about them, their families, their friends, what they care about. You have to understand the company's organization. I get a lot of my information from the sales department because they're always so quick and eager. They're hungry. People trust too easily. They don't look at the details. I do. Details matter. That's what I'm good at. It has to look completely believable. It has to look familiar. This is where research is important. It's not some generic piece of spam. It's an email from their boss with their company's signature. It's written in the voice of the boss. It's what he would say if he were writing this. What about the malware itself? How does that work? Somebody else out there already wrote all the code that does the actual attack. I'm just using it in the attachment. My skill is in my ability to get a bunch of people to click on that attachment. I always wonder what it's like when the whole thing unfolds on their end when the panic sets in. Please leave your message after the beep. Hey, this is Rajiv in finance. Call me as soon as you get this. Something's up with my laptop. I can't Katie, are you on your way to the office? Something's going on with our file uh, servers. This is the Karen in HR. Our benefits dashboard seems really slow. We're getting calls from users on it. Can you call me and get this? Joining conference now. Apparently, there's a malware attack targeting our main... It's ransomware. They're holding us hostage. We're locked out of everything. I, I can't even check my phone. What about the backup? That will take days. We need this fixed now. You pay it. We don't have a choice. We're reporting earnings in two hours. But how do we know Just that they'll pay it? Put every single person on getting us back up and running. That's the only priority now. Okay, it's done. I have the decrypt key. Mark, we have a big problem. The ransomware was just to distract us. They got inside. They got everything. Customer data, financials, everything. Qualicart is reeling today from the news that hackers have released the personal information of nearly the 2 Nasdaq million The Nasdaq closed customers. lower today, led by Qualicart, which was down 14% on news that their recent data breach may be far worse than the company originally stock acknowledged. fell to a new all-time low on news that CEO Mark Hanning is stepping down after what is turning out to be one of the worst breaches of personal information in recent history. Do you feel bad about releasing the personal information? All the financials? All the money that was lost? All I did was get the files. I'm not the one that decided to release them. I'm not the one that shorted the stock. Somebody else had their reasons for that. It's above my pay grade. I was paid to do a job, and I did it well. 
and that's what's expected of anyone, isn't it? Anyway, markets bounce back. So who here was terrified by that video? <laughs> OK. And, and you know, it, it wasn't unrealistic. It was a very real world scenario. Um, so yeah, a little later, we're, we're going to go through that bit by bit and understand exactly what happened. So what is ransomware? Well, it's code, malicious code that's meant to uh, encrypt the victim's file system until they pay a ransom. To, uh, to a company or a criminal that is the keeper of the key that can decrypt it uh, and have to pay a ransom for it. And the ransom's usually in the form of cryptocurrency, and the most popular cryptocurrency in the US is Bitcoin. So here's a little chart, interesting chart, uh, one uh, that you'll see on the evolution of ransomware all the way back to 1989. Uh, at least this chart shows the, the origin of ransomware. And you see how it's grown over time. This is just to 2016. So it's just getting more and more popular. Why? What's the motivation behind all the efforts spent on ransomware? So this is just one of the variants, Locky. And you can see some of the numbers there. <clears throat> you see that there's uh, one Bitcoin is $610. That was in 2016. Who knows how much a Bitcoin is worth now, today, about Kelly? How do you know this? <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> I called you out. Did anybody else know that? That's $1,200. So that's you know double if you do your math. So take those big numbers and add a lot more to them. So it, it's a profitable industry to be in. And the changes in technology has made it a lot easier for criminals to, to do business as a, as, you know, that's their means of business, right? So it didn't, you don't, they don't have to write their own code, set up their own infrastructure. A lot of these um, malware codes are already done and you can just rent or lease them from a company that offers that as a service. So cybercrime as a service, one of the new as a service terms. And it's very profitable. So again, just to emphasize before, criminals would have to have their own servers, their own coders, their own infrastructure, put a lot of money into it and a lot of time and effort. And as a result, it only made sense to target large customers um, to make it a payoff. <clears throat> now, you can just, with cybercrime as a service or malware as a service, whatever you want to call it, you can just uh, download the malware or have another uh, infrastructure uh, distribute it for you for a fee, and that covers your tracks, right? It's not as easy to track you if you're not the one distributing the malware. So it's only made it easier for them. And the people that are out there that are offering this, this serv as a service for malware, they're making big money too. <clears throat> uh, gone are the days where you're just draining a bank account or uh, you know, maxing out somebody's credit card or creating a new credit card and maxing it out, taking somebody's identity. It's just not worth it anymore now. You can do a lot of these distributed attacks easily and can target several companies at once, even smaller sized companies that are maybe more willing to just, you know, pay the ransom so they can silence it and get on with business. So let's talk about how ransomware works. Well, how you can acquire ransomware. These are a couple of the ways. The, the way in the video they showed was through phishing. Right? It was an email. It had an attachment. And you download this attachment. Uh, you can also get them through unpatched programs and drive-by downloads. When you install your application, it's got the little checkbox at the bottom. Would you like to also install this toolbar or whatever? It's an example of a drive-by download. Um, unpatched programs are really a big deal. You've got to keep up on those patches. Compromised websites, websites that don't even know they're distributing malware have been commandeered um, and they're distributing malware. Who knows what malvertising is? Anybody heard that term? Malvertising. A legitimate website, Jake, thanks. Um, <clears throat> a legitimate website rents out real estate on its website for advertisers. You know, an advertising company. 
One of those ads can be injected with malware. So you look at the page, you download the malware. Sometimes it doesn't even give you any indication that it's downloading the malware and it's on your system. And free software downloads, you know, tune up my PC or make my Mac run faster, of course, those are kind of obvious ones. But sometimes they're legitimate tools, ones you may have been using for years and years, but they're just little free tools, you know, open source. Um, that you can download a couple of instances within our company of a, a, a couple of very popular basic tools where the latest version was ransom was uh, a malware at least so um, you know you, you just have to watch out for that sort of thing as well it's not always obvious so okay we talked about how to distribute it let's break it down a little bit more the first part is typically an exploit kit when you retrieve it over email or over the web, you, an exploit kit will run and look for vulnerabilities on your system. And then it reaches back this through a command and control mechanism to a, to a server in the cloud to, uh, to custom make uh, ransomware that utilizes or exploits uh, what's available on your system. So command and control has uh, several terms. You'll hear CNC, C2, botnet, um, I think botnet was the first term and it was uh, used to where one server would commandeer several servers out there which it would then term as its botnet army which sounds fun and futuristic but usually it was just used for spam campaigns and things along those lines but lately they've been calling it C2 so anyway the exploit kit runs checks back with the server the server says okay here's the malware for them the command and control mechanism pulls down the malware and installs it, runs it, it installs it on your system, the malware. Then it reaches out again to the, uh, the infrastructure and the cloud infrastructure, pulls down a private key. This private key is used to encrypt your entire file system. Then it also pulls down the page that says, hey, you've been, uh, you know, all of your files are encrypted. Here are the instructions for decrypting it. So there, there are several steps there, and as we talk about later, several places where these threats can be mitigated. <coughs> so again, a review. Email-based infection, like we saw in the video, you pull down the exploit kit. That's the origin of it. It installs after doing, running the exploit kit, downloads the malware, uh, ransomware rather, and then we'll pull down the key. The same thing with the web. You go out to a website, pull down the exploit kit, it runs does the same thing. <coughs> so now let's take apart that video. From the beginning, this company, Qualicart, by the way, Qualicart and the individuals mentioned are all fictitious. Uh, we'll take it apart here. So it doesn't mention why Qualicart was a target, and even the attacker didn't really give any, it doesn't matter to her, right? She was just hired to do the job, right? So for some reason, Qualicart was the target, and this Mark Hanning is the CEO of Qualicart. So she did a little easy research, did a lookup, and uh, does anybody recognize the, uh, that's probably really hard to see back there, but this SP in a search engine, anybody know what that is? So I'll flick over and show you here. Start page, anybody heard of that? The world's most secure, claimed to, at least claims to be the world's most private search engine. My only point in that was saying that she was trying to stay on the down low, right? She was trying to stay undetected with even her research and reconnaissance, didn't want anybody tracking her back, so she was trying to stay private. She finds Mac Mark Hanning, confirms that in fact he is the CEO of uh, Qualicart. Then she goes on to the one application on the web where way too many people put way too much information, Facebook. Um, However, you know, even on the front page, relationships says that Mark here is married to Lisa Hanning. So let's do a little research on Lisa to see what we can find. Lisa went to Wesleyan University. So then the attacker fabricates uh, this uh, character, Julie, and reaches out and says, hey, remember me back from college? You know, and tries to add herself as a friend with a friend request. Julie, or Lisa rather, says, well, I don't remember Julie, but you know, she knew a lot of people in college. So she accepts the request. And after that, the hacker is looking through all of her personal photos of her kids. And I think that was probably the most disturbing part of the whole video is, is this attacker is looking through her, their personal life to try to gather clues as to how they can compromise this company. 
And also, uh, there was a quick little blurb here. There was a uh, press release where it was telling about Qualicart was making record earnings. So that was information she could keep as uh, part of her attack. And she does a lookup on this, uh, uh, this employment site. It's, uh, it was like employ.net. I think it's a British uh, in, uh, job site, LinkedIn sort of thing. And she was able to glean from that the other employees that work at Qualicart and then went on to Qualicart's website, clicked on contact sales. There was a reason for this. Just reached out and fabricated some request to meet them for whatever reason. The sales department, of course, wants sales. So they reply back uh, to Mario, this, this, this other uh, fabricated individual, to say, yeah, we'd love to meet you. Okay? Included in his signature is included in his email is a signature which the attacker uses to just grab the signature and, and, and plug in a fictitious user which we'll cover here in just a second so that the signature looks legitimate. Uh, before that step, but it made, made sense to go there first, she does a little search to see what domain names are similar in spelling to Qualicart. Saw that Qualicart, just replacing the I with the L, was available. Added the domain. You get a free email account with it, created an email, m.hanning at Qualcart, which is very close to m.hanning at Qualicart, and that's what she used back here to create that signature. Then she goes out to Malware R Us, downloads malware from the service, and they say, look at, look at the Bitcoins they're asking for, 100,000 Bitcoins. So it's $12,000 a pop, that's a lot of money. That's a high ransom. Right, downloads the file. This is an exploit kit. Includes it in an email that looks legitimate out to the individuals that she gathered off of that employment site, a number of them. Attaches the forged signature, the attachment. It looks legitimate. It references the uh, press release. You know, hey, good job on the earnings last you know, quarter. Keep it up. Here are our plans in this attached PDF. And only a discerning eye, I don't have it show it on this uh, chart here, would, would, would be able to tell that in the top, the email address had an I instead of an L to try to thwart the effort. So, of course, people look at it. It looks legit. They want to know what's going on. They open the PDF, and next thing you know, they pull it down, and ransomware compromises their machines. Uh, the nice thing about this is the attacker gets a nice handy dashboard of how many installs and how many locked screens there are. So that's uh, it's very convenient for the attacker, not so much for the victim. Right, Tom? Um, then the panic sets in. IT gets calls. My PC's running slow. I can't get in. I got this weird screen. And, uh, you know, IT gets up to management, upper management. What do we do? We can't let this get out. Our reputation is at stake. We got to shut it down as quickly as possible, pay the ransom. I don't care how, care how much it is. We just got to shut it down before the word gets out. But they're using a browser, the Tor browser. Who knows that is? The Onion Router, Tor. You guys heard of that? Just wraps things in layers so that it's hard to track. So she's using all these tools on the, you know, where she can cover her tracks. You notice she's doing the entire thing from some coffee shop, the entire attack. So even they tracked it back by IP to this, you know, what are they going to do? Right? So anyway. The victim decides to pay the ransom, they get the key, they unlock their system, and all is good, the system comes back. It's done, it's quieted, their reputation is saved, they're just out a bunch of money, and they can move on. Except that the ransomware was only covering for the real attack, where with the command and control mechanisms, you know, they're inside, they're past their perimeter firewall on systems with free reign to whatever goes on inside their network. And they found a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, which were all their financial information and uh, uh, social security cards, which I, I didn't grab a picture of because it made me nervous even to get a, a snapshot of, of, of uh, fictitious social security numbers. But, uh, you know, everything from this company they need to ruin the company. Okay. And then the repercussions. So word gets out that they were compromised. Confidential information was leaked. The stocks go down, the shareholders are starting to bail out. Um, the news finds out, and they're more than willing to drag you through the mud. Then, uh, you know, the stocks fall even more as a result of that. And the shareholders are looking for 
someone to hold accountable for this, and they need their scapegoat. And poor Mark Hanning, who had exactly nothing to do with this attack, maybe he didn't even receive this attachment, wasn't aware at all, he takes the fall for it. Right? So, there's real world. Who, who, how, who here thought that was a realistic scenario? It was, very, it was very realistic. It was a real world example, and really all it took was it took somebody being targeted and enough research to find their way to get in there and do what it needs to do. So, blanket generic security mechanisms that just do the basics. You know, I'm sure they ran antivirus. I'm sure they had firewalls. Um, they might have even had intrusion detection, but it, w it wasn't enough in this case to shut them down. So let's talk about how we can mitigate those risks. Uh, who here has seen this, the attack continuum, Cisco attack continuum, the before, during, and hey, you don't count. Cisco guys back there. Got a couple of Cisco guys with me in the back here, Tim and Jim. They don't count. So this is Cisco's before, during, and after model, and they stress the protection all throughout the cycle of protection before, harden, to try to keep them from getting in, detect while an attack is happening, and then the things that are missed later you can come back and learn from that and do some remediation to that. And I'll go into a more specific detail of how that'll work as we move on here. So this is a model, and it, and it covers all these endpoints, you know, the network, mobile, um, the virtual, and cloud. Uh, so this model is what Cisco's been using for their security products to try to, to fit them into this model. Um, none of the other competitors really are paying any attention to after or much of it. They're more on the before and during. So we're going to talk about Secure Internet Gateway in particular. We'll talk about Umbrella. Why? So a lot of these C2 communications, remember that's command and control, botnet, CNC, they rely on DNS to work. So in the case of the video, the, the attacker, let's talk about how it could have helped in this case. The attacker, you know, attached the exploit kit um, and then sent it as an email attachment. There was an opportunity for a really, e for, uh, oh, so let me, let me go past that quick and say that, let's say that it gets past their, their security on their endpoint and it is installed, maybe it's new, maybe it's just crafted, so it's zero day and nobody knows anything about it. But at the point where the exploit kit is run, it uses DNS to find its cloud server before it can reach out and say, hey, here are the vulnerabilities. That's a point where any DNS security could have mitigated that risk as well. Um, the malware, where it would have been downloaded from this uh, malicious infrastructure, that's an opportunity where uh, DNS security could have shut it down because they used DNS to reach out to the, um, this infrastructure. If the malware is installed, it's got to reach out to grab a private key, it uses DNS to reach the malicious infrastructure, that's another chance for it to shut it down. And then finally, um, you know, the payment message saying, you know, pay up, that's also DNS. So that's just telling you that quite a bit of these common variants could have mitigated their risk with DNS security. And Cisco really positions it as the first line of defense because it's not just web security. Web security, if you think about it, really is only for web protocols and types. A lot of your web security solutions out there are only doing, you know, 80, 443, maybe some FTP, a couple of other web protocols, 80, 80, but not everything. DNS is all protocols. So anything that has to go out on, on the internet, chances are they're using DNS to resolve that name. So that's an opportunity for it to get in there and not slow things down. So again, here's an example. I kind of uh, stole my own thunder on this one earlier, but in the case of coming through where you got a compromised website, well, if the site is known to be distributing malware, it can be shut down right there. So DNS can do that, and some web security can probably do that as well. Uh, again, the C2 infrastructure where it pulls down the, the exploit and or pulls down the private key. If it's using DNS, that's where it can get shut down. Um, and then uh, it's the same with a phishing scam or another email distributed malware. Um, you know, it, it won't, it won't, the DNS security won't stop the delivery of the mail, but once you try to install it, if it's installed over a web link, like click this link, that's a way to mitigate it. Or if it comes through as a file and the file reaches out to a malicious infrastructure, that's where it can get shut down at several points along the line here. So endpoint security. We always heard of AMP, advanced malware protection to some degree. Yeah, okay. So what's different about AMP 
is uh, it's not just an antivirus or it doesn't just do some of the things that other endpoint protection software does. It will still do, oh, let's compare it first to your typical point in time antivirus programs, the ones that are out there, the popular ones. Typically they only have uh, two dispositions. There's known bad and there's unknown. So either it has the signature locally on in your cache and it drops it, or it says, I don't know what this is, and the file goes on and is never looked at again. So if that shows up later as malware, then uh, there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, whereas AMP will keep track of that file, all of the files. Their movements, their activity, if they rename themselves, if they spawn other files, what other systems they're installed on, it keeps track of full history of all movement of all files, and really with a very lightweight footprint, so that you can keep monitoring these files, and if there are signs that they're malicious, then it can do the respond, which is, hey, this one got through. We didn't know it was malicious originally, but now we know that it is. So we're going to quarantine, and we're going to change the rules so that new, the new files like this cannot be downloaded. That's the before, during, and after tie-in with AMP. Uh, yeah, so if we're doing, like I said, to compare to other uh, point-in-time antivirus softwares, um, the files that come through, if you're using sleep techniques or unknown protocols, if the files rename themselves, spawn other files, uh, the other ones aren't just going to, they're not going to see it. And that's very, very common with today's malware. Whereas if you're continuously monitoring all these files, you can say, where did this file come from? Where it originally was over here is this file, right? And here's where it originally came into your network or the first endpoint when it presented itself. So Talos, anyone heard of ta Talos, Cisco Talos? Okay, so Cisco Talos is, uh, Talos is Cisco's threat intelligence database. And the origins of this, and guys can pipe in if I'm saying this wrong, I think probably started with uh, the, Iron Port ex uh, the Iron Port acquisition uh, by Cisco. So the sender base came, is a large part of Talos as well. The source fires um, vulnerability research team was combined in with that. They already had a very significant threat intelligence database as well as some of the other several acquisitions that Cisco have been doing have been tying into Cisco's uh, Talos Threat Intelligence Database. And it sees three times the traffic that Google does daily. Internet traffic. Three times the traffic that Google does. And it's, it's global and worldwide. So um, that's used by several of the Cisco security um, components. Right, so again, it keeps track of this. So how AMP works really, uh, in a nut the AMP was very complex and I can talk about AMP for two hours, which I won't. But uh, first it'll come through, it takes a SHA-256 of a file so that it's just a string of characters. It'll look in its local cache to say, hey, do I have this, is this a common file that I'm seeing? It has three dispositions, known good, known bad, and unknown. So if I see this, if it's known good, you're allowed to pass. If it's known bad, I'm gonna drop it. If it's unknown, let's see what else we can do with it. We're gonna do a cloud lookup and look up using Talos into the, the cloud database to say, do you have a, a disposition for the SHA-256? And it's gonna come back with one of the three dispositions, known good, known bad, unknown. Uh, if Talos says, well, this is still unknown, <clears throat> for some of these file types, you can opt to then send these files up to threat grid for further analysis where it'll take the file apart, it'll run it through a sandbox, it'll compare its structure to other known malware, uh, look at the behavior, and then the disposition that, that uh, threat grid takes, it will plug into the Talos um, database so that anybody looking for a cloud lookup on that SHA-256 henceforth will have a disposition for it. Uh, uh, AMP for endpoints also has device trajectory and file trajectory. So uh, what file trajectory is, is it can keep track of what all endpoints this file has been on. I'm looking for this file, where's it at? It's been on all these machines, uh, in, in a timeline even of where it's gotten to each of the machines. Device trajectory looks at a single endpoint, takes it apart, looks at what things it's done on that machine, what files it's touched, what registry changes it's changed. So you really can, you're not gonna run into this mystery file and say, well, where did this come from? It comes back to at least to the point of origin where AMP for endpoints is installed. That's very powerful. And it decreases the time to detection from 100 days to 13 hours or less. Who, who here thinks 100 days is not good enough for a file to be known as, as malicious? That's, way, that's a long time. So, so it's, it's very fast and lightweight. 
I want to touch on email security too because it's important and we need to make sure we continue to talk about email and web are still the top two threat vectors. So it's important that you have a sufficient email security. Uh, Cisco's two email platforms are uh, uh, email security appliance, formerly known as Ironport, or cloud email security. So if you take the email security appliance, virtualize it and stick it in the cloud, that's cloud email security. And it has the ability to add on AMP with the same, can do a current disposition, can analyze files, and can do a retrospective alert if one was passed, initially did not have a bad disposition, but later on shows up as good disposition. So it does that as well. Um, it still does the continuous analysis, um, still ties into the Talos database. So that gives you, what you want to do is keep it as far away from your infrastructure as possible. You don't want to wait until something gets to your endpoint before it's detected, especially if you're talking about mobile users and roaming users, right? If there are a lot of people now, there's a, I didn't put percentages of it because I keep seeing different percentages all over the place for it, but a growing large number of users are working from home, are working remotely. So if you're not within your campus, you're, you're not under the protection of your perimeter security unless you're VPNing in with no split. More and more people are not doing that because of, as a service applications, you can go right to your application straight from the internet without having to go through your VPN. So it's important that this endpoint security and AMP for endpoints in particular has the ability to be, you know, it's cloud managed. So um, you can have it on your endpoints and have the same protection whether you're on campus or off campus. Internet edge security, of course, is still very important. Firepower, who's heard of firepower here? Yeah, okay. So the, the, you know, there was the PICS back in the day, and then there was the ASA, and then the ASA wanted to get into the next generation firewall market, so they made the ASA 5500X series. And originally they developed their own next generation firewall that could do IPS and some uh, um, you know, antivirus protection and uh, application visibility and control. And right around then they acquired Sourcefire. And Sourcefire had been doing it, it had a great reputation for it, and it was, was really off the charts so far as uh, um, you know, Gartner reports and such. So Cisco acquired them and abandoned the next generation firewall, took the Sourcefire technology and virtualized it and crammed it into the ASA 5500X. Basically, yeah? Yeah, so, um, you know, that works out well and great, except that it, it, at times it can be a bit of a, a, a stress on your on resources for the ASA 5500s. They're still very valid devices. So the next uh, revision of this are the firepower appliances, where they're designed from the ground up for, um, you know, for firepower services. And now, you know, the ASA with firepower still had two operating systems, if you will. One was the ASA operating system, and you had to manage that one separately in the firepower operating system. Now they're combining that to, to have uh, firepower threat defense, a unified operating system that can do it all. And these firepower uh, devices, the firepower appliances are, like I said, built from the ground up to be tuned especially for, uh, like, firepower threat defense. So you get the most out of your box and software. So to circle back to this model, except it was red before, blue looks friendlier. So they, Cisco tries to plug in all of their applications and all their services where they can under the attack continuum, but it has to fit under there somewhere. And some of these are a little floaty. For example, AMP for AMP is really across all of these because it's, it does the protection before, it continuously monitors during, and then it can do the retrospective events afterwards where it catches something later and says, oh, you know, this one was not originally malicious, now it is, so now we're gonna take that information and then plug it back into before, so it's prevention, right? So, um, you know, you got your ASA, firepower, threat defense, um, any connect, firepower, umbrella, which we'll talk about, an umbrella kind of floats along these other ones as well. Stealth Watch. So ICE is the identity services engine. Uh, who are you? What kind of device you have? Uh, and, and some other things uh, to see if you're even allowed to be on the network or join the Wi-Fi or connect over wireless. So um, as Cisco adds security products to their portfolio, they'll fall under here. All right. So, so here's some sources I had. The anatomy of an attack um, is, was, the, was the video, and you, you can Google that and find that. And then uh, one of them was Ransomware Defense for Dummies. It's a really great little book. I actually found it as a, as a booklet, but it's available as a PDF for free. And if you search for that, you can get all these other ones as well.